Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to Mill Creek Baptist Church this morning. If you're joining us for the first time, we have connection cards in our pews. If you would just fill that out and place it in an offering plate, that just gives us information about yourself and how to reach back out to you. Let's go to the Lord for a broad prayer this morning. Uh, dear Lord, uh, just thank you for letting us gather here this morning, Lord. Lord, just uh, thank you for the season of Advent, Lord. Lord, may we just anticipate uh, your coming again, Lord. And Lord, may we celebrate uh, your first coming, Lord. Lord, uh, I just pray that just during this hour, Lord, that we would just uh, give you all the honor and glory and praise this time morning, Lord. Lord, uh, just in this time, may we prepare our hearts just to truly worship you. And Lord, I pray that you would just be with Pastor Danny as he uh, gives the message, Lord. Lord, may your word speak to our hearts and may it change us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Mill Creek. Good morning to those online with us this morning. I told the first service, I think this is one of my favorite Christmas carols. So would you please stand with us as we sing Joy to the World.
Sometimes it helps to be able to put a face and a personality with the gift that you're giving. And so let me just draw your attention to the video monitors so that we can help with that this morning. All right, guys. It's that time of year again. As I'm a missionary, I want to let all our supporting churches know how much we appreciate it. I know what you do. Yeah, I was thinking that might be fun, Dad. You always think making videos is fun. Guilty as charged. How about we make a video about you making a video? I mean, you've traveled around the world taking photos of missionaries and doing videos of the amazing work that they're doing. Yeah, and you still travel a lot. You met I'm meeting medical missionaries in Tanzania. You saw STEM relief working with Ukrainian refugees in Poland. You attended a new church plant in Kosmos in Senegal. You even saw African missionaries evangelizing to unreached people groups. Okay, that's a good idea. Or we can show you doing your medical ministry at the hospital. Doing surgery, training other medical professionals, sharing the gospel with your patients. Uh, I think you would prefer epic unicycling tricks. Yeah, and we can show the medal of training one at the World Championship. Okay. And they should see all our animals. All of the dogs? Of course. All of our goats? Yeah. Yeah, that's where I draw the line. So then which idea are we going to go with? You making videos? Or me doing surgery or trade doing unicycling? And Abigail. Who's Abigail? My favorite no, dog. Not. You should be in the video. Hold on. I may have a solution that makes everybody happy. behind your gift and hopefully the Han family will help to do just that. And so con continue to pray about what you would give. Remember that 100% of the gifts we give toward our Lottie Moon Christmas offering go straight to our missionaries who are serving abroad. And so I want to encourage you with that. We'll pray for our missionaries in just a moment, but also want to remind you of a few folks on the prayer list. Uh, this morning. First of all, our person of prayer for this week is Jordan Everly, and um, I know Jordan would appreciate you praying for her with her daily routine, but she's also got this thing called a wedding coming up this morning, <laughs> and I'm sure she would appreciate prayers as they continue working and planning toward that as well. Um, if you've been to Sunday school recently, you have probably heard in our adult Sunday school classes about a, a family from the Ukraine that is relocating to Fincastle. That's crazy to think about, but it's a family that the Barquettes met when they were away and connected with, and now they are helping to bring them um, to the U.S. They fled the Ukraine when war broke out, and so a mother, father, and their eight, nine-year-old son are due to arrive this week in Fincastle. We have been praying for them. We've been um, collecting things to help them uh, get established here. And we have three prayer blankets. They're up here behind these poinsettias, but a prayer blanket for the father, for the mother, and for the son. And I would encourage you to pray over those today. Uh, we'll be praying over them in just a moment. We also have a prayer blanket all the way to the farthest, my left on the stage, that's going to Hatcher Ferguson. Hatcher lives in Rocky Mount, a friend of um, <clears throat> John Powell's. And uh, Hatcher recently um, experienced severe burns on his hands and face from a sawmill accident. Is that what you said, John? A sawmill accident and going through skin, skin grafts and other things right now. So remember Hatcher and this prayer blanket that we'll be praying over for him. In our early service, we had a prayer blanket that we prayed over for Joe Campbell. Joe's been on our prayer list for a little while. He's the father-in-law of Laurel Bowser's boss. And Joe suffered a significant accident at work in October and still dealing with the effects um, in recovery <clears throat> from that and complications. So uh, remember them as well. Number of folks on our list 
Uh, the, I mentioned earlier the Clark family, Kyle, Anna, and Roman, all three uh, have COVID, and a lot of people are dealing with respiratory stuff right now, and so continue to pray for them. I know folks um, have been diagnosed with flu recently. Sheila Spates is one of those. Got Last week, I said about 15-plus people on our list that are going through treatments for cancer right now. Sue Sweet had her final chemo treatment on Friday. These are, um, each day coming up here gets a little more difficult for Sue until she turns that corner and, and things start to get better. But the side effects from this last chemo treatment. So be praying for Sue. And then first part of the year, she'll begin um, 15 days of radiation as a follow-up. Excuse me, want to remember them. Also, um, a number of folks who have lost loved ones recently and a difficult, I mean, it's difficult to lose a loved one at any time, but especially here at the holidays. Uh, yesterday, we celebrated Peggy Fridley's life here in this place, and such a beautiful and sweet woman she was. And remember, uh, Mike and Pam, they were here in our first hour, as well as uh, the rest of the Fridley family. Also, Arthur Price, uh, Becky and Arthur. Um, Arthur's dad passed away last Saturday, and his celebration of life was yesterday. And Muriel Shorts, Aunt Pamela, um, her service was Friday. Remember these families who have lost loved ones recently as well. And I'm sure you have a variety of requests on your hearts and minds. And so um, God can hear them. If I pray and you pray, God can hear us all at the same time. So I would encourage you to either affirm what I pray, or maybe if the Spirit lays something particular on your heart, you would lift that up during this time. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. God, we do come before you in the beauty of this sanctuary, this place that has been dedicated to worship of you. Father, we thank you for how pretty it is right now, for all those who helped to make um, the visual aspect of Christmas come to life for us and pray your blessings on them. Bless us, Father, as we come into your presence to worship you this morning. Father, speak boldly to us through the power of your spirit to the inner depths of our hearts and Reveal what you would to each one of us individually today as we continue to worship you through songs and hymns and spiritual songs, through looking into your word. May your spirit speak boldly to us. Father, we thank you for Jordan, for what she means to our church family. But, Lord, she's got a lot going on right now between work and preparing for a wedding. And so we just pray that you would help her order her time and days in such a way that she will be able to get the things done that are necessary. Father, help her not to stress over the things that she can't complete at the time she wants to. And Father, just guide and direct her. Lord, uh, for those who are experiencing respiratory issues, whether COVID or um, other kinds of things right now, Father, we pray that you would restore healing and uh, restore their lungs and breathing and voices and remove coughs and all the other things that are a byproduct of these different viruses right now. <coughs> For those dealing with the flu, Lord, pray for them, for strength, for temperatures to go back to normal, and uh, for rest to recover. Father, for so many that are on our list dealing with cancer, we especially think of Sue and Lou Ann Millsaps and others, Lord, who are experiencing this, and pray that the chemo that their bodies are receiving will um, be aggressive and killing the cancer, but will not attack other parts of their body, but Lord, they'll be back on the road to healing quickly. Father, for those who have lost loved ones recently, Father, this holidays are going to look different, and so we pray, you promise the comfort of your spirit, so we pray that for them, that they would experience the presence of your spirit, holding them up, carrying them through a time of celebration that isn't very celebratory maybe for them this year. So be with them, Lord, we pray. For these prayer blankets, Lord, for the Ukrainian family that's moving into our area. Father, they're learning new customs, new traditions, new language. And so, Father, we pray that as we encounter them, that we would be patient. Lord, that we would be welcoming. Father, that we would let them know that we want to support and help them in any way we can as they transition into this community. And so may these blankets provide that sense of hope for them. For the blanket that is going to be going out to, uh, to Hatcher, Lord, I can't imagine 
being burned to the point of having to receive the skin grafts and those kinds of things and the pain involved with that. So, Lord, we pray that this blanket will just bring a sense of comfort and hope to him. Father, for others on our list that we may not have mentioned, but you know who they are. Lord, we pray that they would experience whatever they need from you. And Father, especially right now, while we're thinking about our international missionaries with our Lottie Moon Christmas offering, we pray your blessings on them. They're separated from family stateside in so many cases. But Father, you've called them to where they are. And we know that when you call, you give us what we need. And so, Father, we pray for them. Lift them up as they share the good news of Jesus Christ. And if, Father, we can sacrificially give to help spread that gospel message that speaks to our hearts. And show us where and how and how much. But we do pray a special blessing on our missionaries right now. Be with us, Lord, as we continue to worship through giving. Father, it's an opportunity that we have to express our gratitude and our love for you. So as we collect our offering now, Lord, may you bless it as we continue to share the good news of Christ here in Abrala. In Jesus' name, amen. church you probably don't even know we have a whole band back here that will be playing for us now or with us now and this afternoon and tonight so we will have all live music this year
Dispatch gives you a taste of what's to come this afternoon and this evening, and it makes you go, we're changing our plans. We're going to church tonight. Because I can guarantee you the whole thing is that much fun, and uh, you will be glad that you were here if you come. Take your Bibles this morning and open them up to Isaiah chapter 9. Hopefully by now your Bible's almost just flopping right open to that spot. Uh, for the last several weeks, we've been hanging out right here in Isaiah 9. And um, as you're making your way there this morning, as I was continuing to just kind of process and roll this through my head, I thought, I need to get my inner country singer on today. I was going to bring my black cowboy hat, and then I realized that my mom sees me with a hat on the inside. <laughs> it just wouldn't be good. So I left the hat at home and tried to just get as country as I could this morning. And you may be saying, Danny, why do you want to get your inner country self on this morning? Well, it's because as I thought about this sermon, a country song came to my mind. George Strait uh, sang and recorded a song entitled Love Without End, Amen. In the song, you know, country songs, they have a storyline to them. It, Flows. And so the story begins with this little boy who comes home from school with a black eye because he got in a fight at school. And he knew that his dad frowned upon that kind of thing. And so he rehearsed what he was going to say to his dad the whole time coming home from school. And of course, dad got home from work and he shared the story. And much to his surprise, his dad said, let me tell you a secret about a father's love. A secret that my daddy said was just between us. He said, daddies don't just love their children every now and then. It's a love without end. Amen. Were you singing? Yes. Oh, you got to. There's just, yeah, and so as the story goes, the boy grows up, he becomes a father himself, and his son comes to him at some point with a mistake he had made, he shares that secret with his son. And then, you know, as country songs do, the key changes, the progression goes up, it gets a little more, you know, you can tell something's really happening, and here's how the last verse goes. Last night I dreamed I died and stood outside those pearly gates when suddenly I realized there must be some mistake. If they knew half the things I've done, they'll never let me in. And then somewhere from the other side, I heard these words again. Are you ready? Let me tell you a secret about a father's love. A secret that my daddy said was just between us. You see, daddies don't just love their children every now and then. It's a love without end. Amen. Told you. Some of y'all need to change the radio guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I couldn't help but think about that song to go along with this morning's message as we continue our season of Advent, our journey toward the celebration of Christmas Day. For us as Christians, it's a time in which we remember the birth of our Savior who was born in Bethlehem years ago and wrapped in cloths and placed in a manger. Isaiah, specifically in the passage that we're reading, but in a variety of places throughout Scripture, Scripture identifies what the name of this child would be, and we've been looking at these various names since Advent began. This passage in Isaiah is one that gives us some information about Jesus' identity, about his character, about who he would be to the Israelite nation that Isaiah was prophesying to, as well as how we can experience him in our lives today. We're looking at the unique identity of each name as God revealed it to Isaiah, and what that name can reveal to us today as we wait for Christ's return. That's what Advent is about. It's a season of waiting. We know Christ has already come, and now we wait for his return one day. But I also have to say that today's message comes with a warning label attached. A disclaimer, if you would. Because I know that not everybody who hears this message today 
has had a good relationship with their father. I know that not everybody has had a father figure in their life. I also know that we tend to view God, our Heavenly Father, through the lens in which we have observed our earthly father. And for some of you, that's just difficult. And I know that. And I'm sorry. I really am. My hope and my prayer is that as you listen to this today, that you'll allow the Holy Spirit to speak and begin to peel back the layers of callousness on your heart and maybe you can look at your Heavenly Father through a different lens today than you do your earthly one. So with that in mind, let's look at Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 today. <clears throat> For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called, say it with me, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Verse 7, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Well, have you ever thought about what God had in mind? When he gave a baby to be born in Bethlehem, the title Everlasting Father. It's a baby yet to be born, but he's an everlasting father. It's a child that will grow up, but he's an everlasting father. When God gave Isaiah this prophecy, it was over 700 years before the Messiah's birth. It was 2,700 years ago from us. So what is it that God was wanting the Israelites to pick up on 700 years prior? They didn't know how long it would be. It ended up being over 700 years. But what did he want the Israelites to discover? What difference should the name Everlasting Father mean to them in their day? And what should it mean to us today? What is it that we can take away from this passage and apply to our lives when it comes to our Messiah being our everlasting Father. Well, when we think back to this time, remember in the last couple of messages, we've talked about the situation that the Israelites found themselves in. We know that people were living in difficult and troubling times. That's in the first few verses of this chapter. There was confusion they were worried. They were concerned about the things that were going to happen. They were concerned and stressed about the things that Isaiah said would happen. And they needed something to hold on to. They needed hope of some kind in the midst of the gloom and doom that they were hearing about. They needed someone they could depend on when others all around them were failing them and letting them down. Maybe you can identify with where the Israelites are. Maybe you're stressed today. Maybe you're concerned about the state of affairs in our country, in our world. Maybe you're worried about what could happen and what might happen. Or maybe people have let you down and that's where you find yourself. In this case, the Israelites needed to be reminded that they were part of a bigger picture. They were part of a larger family, that they were a people group, a nation that God had called to be his own. And Isaiah was reminding them of that. And for the Israelites, they had a father figure. Because if you go back to Genesis, God made a covenant with Abraham. And he said, Abraham, you are going to be the father of many nations. And so the Israelites would have maybe thought back to an everlasting father. Well, we have a father in Abraham. You know, we, if you think about the U.S., we have founding fathers is what we call them. George Washington is a founding father of this nation. It's somebody we look to that kind of helps give character and identity to who we are as a people here. And the Israelites would have done that with Abraham. They needed 
to be reminded. And so God promised them through the prophet Isaiah this proclamation about the one who would come that they could hold on to. I've been sharing with you the Hebrew names as we go. And everlasting father in Hebrew is aviad. It's a hyphenated aviad word. And it means just how it's translated. It means everlasting father. It can also literally be translated father of eternity. I believe that's what Isaiah was emphasizing in verse 7 when he said, Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever, everlasting, eternally, from that time on. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This child would be born of a virgin. He would bring joy. He would bring hope. He would bring peace. He would bring love. The government would be on his shoulders. This child is everlasting, Isaiah said. He has no beginning. He has no end. He existed before he came to earth, and he exists forever. He is eternal. He is everlasting Father. He said, the one who's coming is everlasting. In other words, he's always existed and he always will exist. The Apostle John reminds us of a particular time where Jesus and some of the religious leaders were kind of going toe-to-toe, if you would, as so often happened in Jesus' ministry. If you go back to John chapter 8, beginning in verse 12, and then following through to the end of that chapter, we see this discourse between the religious leaders and Jesus. They questioned Jesus on his authority. They questioned Jesus on his origin, where he came from. They questioned his motives. And as you read through, you kind of get this sense, if you really read it, that that it's a tense um, argument, discussion, conversation. It got heated at times. And I think that Jesus, I don't know if it was an attempt maybe to lighten up the conversation or whatever, but we get to John chapter 8, verse, verse 56, and Jesus says, Because they had already referred back to Abraham. Abraham is our father. Abraham, Abraham, Abraham. And so Jesus says, Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. Well, that didn't put a smile on the religious leader's face at all. What what he is saying there is, look, I, I know Abraham. You can talk about him. I know him. I'm the one who sent him. I knew Abraham before Abraham was Abraham. The religious leaders heard what Jesus said and they responded with anger. In verse 57, they said, You are not yet 50 years old and you have seen Abraham To which Jesus responded by saying, Very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. To understand that statement, we need to remember, go back to Exodus and remember that when God was calling Moses to go and bring the Israelites out of captivity, out of bondage, into the promised land, Moses was pushing back. He was giving every excuse he could. And finally, Moses said, look, what if I go to the people and they don't believe me? Or what if I go to the people and they want to know, okay, who is this guy? What is his name? Who who exactly sent you to us? What am I supposed to tell them? And God told Moses, you simply tell them, I am sent you. And now Jesus is referring to himself here as I am It's an amazing title if you really stop to think about it. Because when you try to describe... I don't know if you've ever tried to describe God to somebody. And if you have, maybe you found yourself going, how do you you describe God? Um, 
Yeah. Man, what's you know, if you've never tried, you ought, to, you ought to sit back and just try it one day. But really, the most accurate statement you can make about God is simply this. He is. What do you mean he is? He is. That's, that's what he is. He exists fully. He exists everywhere. He exists all the time. He didn't have a beginning. He has no end. He simply is. And God said, I am. So in this statement, when Jesus said, I am, what he's telling the religious leaders at that moment is, I'm not only older than Abraham. <laughs> I existed before Abraham because I am God. Jesus is eternal. He has always existed and always will exist. He is Aviad, our everlasting Father. The second part of this phrase, Father. Again, let me just say that no matter how good or bad your earthly father may have been, if he was good, great, he wasn't perfect. If he wasn't good, he's not perfect. We need to come to grips with that right off the bat. Because like I said, I think our image of our earthly father is the lens in which we view our everlasting father. If you had a great fatherly figure, then looking at Christ as everlasting father, you're good with. But if you didn't have, then chances are you're not looking at God or Jesus through the same lens as other people. If you have pleasing images of your father, you'll probably have pleasing images of God. If you had unpleasant images of your father, then you'll have unpleasant images of God. It's just it's that filter by which we view things through. And I think we'll better understand Jesus as our everlasting father. If we can just simply admit and come to terms with the fact that there is no perfect earthly father. Whenever I'm talking with somebody and they say, oh, our family is really dysfunctional, I'm like, every family is dysfunctional. Some people just put more dis in their function than others. <laughs> There's no perfect family. There's no perfect, if there were, oh my heavens. But there's not. And so when it comes to the Messiah, because that's who we're talking about, as Isaiah prophesied, he will be everlasting father. So when it comes to Jesus, our Messiah, being our everlasting father, I thought about some quality traits that would be good for earthly fathers to have. But again, you can have these and still not be perfect. But Jesus is. And so when we think about our, ever, our everlasting father, we need to think about it in terms like this. What does a father, or better yet, what does our everlasting father do for us? Well, he first of all, gives us life. You don't have to spend too much time in biology to understand that a male and female create, can create life. I'm here as a result of my father and mother creating life. It's just the birds and the bees. If you're having a problem with it, go talk to your mom or dad. But in a broader sense, I wasn't just created by my parents. In a broader sense, I was created by God, the creator of all that is. And I will say up front, if you're taking notes, because somebody a couple weeks ago said, I couldn't keep up with all the scripture passages you gave. I'm giving more today. And here's why. I'm doing it especially for people who may have a difficult time looking at God through the lens of a father. Because I don't want you to just take my word on it. I want you to be able to go back to scripture and see what I'm saying. And I had a whole lot more scripture to use that I, I just had to decide which ones to really use and which ones not to this morning. But when it comes to life in Genesis 2-7... 
Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. The psalmist lets us know that we were created in our mother's womb. God knit us together. He formed us, if you would, and he intimately knows us as a result of that. So yes, I am the result of natural birth from parents, but I'm also the result of a God who creates. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, Jesus, as the everlasting Father, John said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. Our everlasting Father created us. Jesus doesn't just give us physical life, though. More importantly, he offers us eternal life. He gives us everlasting spiritual life. In John 5, we've been looking at that over the, the, uh, about a month ago, but in John 5, 24, Jesus said, Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed from death to life. As our everlasting Father, the Messiah gives us life, both physically and spiritually. What does a father, or better yet, what does our everlasting Father do for us? He gives us advice. We looked at this two weeks ago when we learned that Jesus is our wonderful counselor, Pele Yochetz. Through the presence of the Holy Spirit and through His Word to us, Jesus counsels us. He advises us. He helps us to understand what's right and what's wrong, what's within His plan, what, how we can stay within the boundaries He set up for our life. When we need advice, He's always there for us to go to. And He gives just the right advice at just the right time. As our advisor, he's always available to encourage, comfort, and guide us. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 16, verses 7 to 8, I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what kind of things you're experiencing in life. We talked about some of that last week with those things, that we, those forces that we face. But I do know this. As our everlasting Father, He advises us. He gives us counsel, the psalmist said. And with Him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. In Luke 21, 15, Jesus said, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. And to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 1.17, Paul wrote, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. He's our everlasting Father who gives wise counsel, advice. He's our wonderful counselor. If you're a male in this place, above the teenage years, chances are you probably had the same thought as Mark Twain did. I know I did. I didn't know Mark Twain said it. I just knew I thought it. But Mark Twain said this. He said, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to 21, I was astonished at how much the old man learned in seven years. <laughs> oh, I remember being there. I remember telling my mom, because my dad had already passed away, I remember telling my mom, when did you get so smart? Because growing up in your house, I didn't think you were so much. About half of you will remember this reference, but... I think in the 50s, and I know in the 60s, there was a TV show, popular TV show, Father Knows. Uh-huh. More than half of you knew it, yeah. 
They're who we tend to go to for advice. Father knows best. In February, it'll be 40 years since my dad passed away. I can't tell you how many times I thought, I wish he was here to ask this question of. I can't tell you how many times I thought, man, I wish my dad was here to give me wisdom right now. Oh, I wish I'd taken more advantage of it when I had it. We go to fathers for advice and wisdom. Why? Because they've experienced it, especially as a young man. I would go to my dad because my dad was a guy. Certainly he understood some of the things I was dealing with. He had been there and done that. And I know he would have wanted to steer me right and give me wise counsel because fathers give advice about what works and what to stay away from. We go to our fathers. Why? Because we trust them. More importantly, we can always go to our everlasting Father, Christ our Messiah, who loves giving us advice and wisdom and counsel because he has our best interests at heart. What does a father, or better yet, what does our everlasting Father do for us? He loves us. Even though we don't always deserve it, Christ loves us with an unconditional, no-strings-attached kind of love. That's what everlasting fathers do. In my family, even though we didn't always verbalize it, Debbie and I have, have, have sought to really change that in our families, but we didn't, we didn't say, I love you all the time growing up. But I knew my dad loved me. I could tell by his actions. I could tell by the things that he did for me and my siblings. He didn't have to tell me. I knew it because of how he cared for us. My dad wasn't a touchy-feely kind of guy. And so it's not like I got a ton of hugs from him. But I do remember a few times where I was wrapped up in his arms. And I remember the safety and the security I felt at that moment. I knew I was loved. In John 15, 9, Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Remain in my love. As my everlasting Father, I know Jesus loves me even more than my earthly father ever could have. How do I know that? Because I'm a dad, and I know my everlasting father loves my kids more than I ever could. If you've had children or maybe spent some time with children, chances are you've played the so much game. Some of y'all just did what people in the first hour did. What is the so much game? It kind of goes like this. How much does daddy love you? So much. How much does mommy love you? So much. How much does your everlasting father love you? So much. That he stretched open his arms and he allowed them to be nailed on a Roman cross. Because that's how much he loves you. It's an unconditional love. Scripture says he died while we were yet sinners. He died for us so much. Our everlasting Father is always there. Whenever you need a squeeze, whenever you need a hug, go to him in prayer and invite him to wrap his nail-scarred loving hands right around you. And he'll draw you in close and tight because of his love for you. What does a father, or better yet, what does our everlasting father do for us? He protects us. We saw this last week in Jesus, our mighty God, our El Gibor. 
Jesus is our strong, mighty, powerful warrior hero. If you had a loving father in your home growing up, chances are when a storm came, when you heard a bump under your bed, or you thought the boogeyman was in your closet, you ran to him, you sought him out. In our father's arms, we should feel loved, we should feel safe and secure no matter what is happening around us. And I'm sorry if you didn't have that. Kids know, instinctively know their father should protect them. Jesus does that same thing. It boggles my mind to think about the fact that Jesus prayed for me before he went to Calvary. But he prayed for you as well. In the 17th chapter of John, in verses 11 and 12, he said, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost. Everlasting Father, the name you gave me. Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians 3, 3, But the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. Jesus is always there for us to run to, to find safety, to find security, to find those arms that make us feel protected. As our everlasting Father, when we enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, He takes us by the hand and He will not let go. In John chapter 10, verses 27 and 28, Jesus said, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one cell shall snatch them out of my hand. Because he's a protector. Nothing can pull you away from him once you enter into a relationship with him. Jesus is our everlasting Father. He has a permanent parental relationship with us, and as a result, we can experience a powerful relationship with Him. We can experience an everlasting Father who loves us, who protects us, who gives us wise counsel and advice. Jesus came to earth to be our Messiah our everlasting Father. Some of us have lost our earthly fathers. Some of you, at best, may have a strained relationship with yours. But whatever the reason, they're no longer around for your help or protection. When you can't run to them, when life gets tough, remember that you can run too your everlasting Father. Not only will Jesus never leave us or forsake us, but He also loves us and protects us and gives us life. What did the song say? It's a love without end. Amen. God, thank you. thank you. Thank you for giving us our everlasting Father who loves us eternally. Remind us there's nothing we can do to cause you to stop loving us more than you do at this moment. There's also nothing we can do to make you love us more than you do at this moment. Simply because you love us unconditionally. God, you are our everlasting Father. Help us to draw close to you, to recognize you give us life, you give us love, you give us advice, you protect us, and so much more. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you've never invited Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, if he's not your everlasting father yet, what is keeping that from happening? What better gift could you give and receive this Christmas than the gift of your life and heart to him who gave you life? If you'd like to know more about what that means, if you're online, connect with me. If you're here, come and talk to me. Well, we stand and close this hour out by singing a song. If you want to come and have a conversation, I would love to do that. Maybe you're sitting here today and you've realized, you know, I've not, I, I haven't wanted to look at him as father because I haven't had a good view of a father. Maybe the Holy Spirit's changed that today and you just need to take care of some business. You can do that where you are in your house, in the pew, here at the altar. If you'd like to know more about being part of the Mill Creek family, I'd love to share that with you. Maybe, maybe the Holy Spirit's put something on your heart that I'm not even thinking about, but you just know you have to respond to today. We welcome that. If nothing else, this song is an opportunity to continue to worship or to respond. Whatever the Lord leads you to, let's stand and sing together. invite you to come Christmas caroling with us Tuesday night. Just meet here at the church in the fellowship hall at 6.30. You don't have to be able to sing. You can sing beautifully. You can sing not at all. But we had so much fun going to our shut-ins last year. Um, so come and join us. Also want to remind you about the Lottie Moon Post Office right outside these doors. Check under your letter and see if you got any cards. Thank you. I just want to take a minute on behalf of the church's administrative team uh, to say that we as a church are blessed. And at, during this season, uh, actually later this week, our staff will be receiving their Christmas bonuses. Uh, that's a small token that we do administratively for our ministerial staff. Uh, and I would just like to take the opportunity to allow you to show your appreciation to our staff for all that they do for us. So if you would. <laughs> On behalf of the staff, for Cindy, Joel, Peggy, for um, let me just say thank you. We are a team. We uh, we work together. We help one another succeed, and uh, I know that full well. If if any of us succeed, it's because we've got others helping to make that happen. And so thank you, thank you from the bottom of our heart for that gift, and uh, we appreciate it very much. This month. This year, this month, we are allowing our benediction to be the song that we sing. And so let me invite you to stand, remind you to come back this evening, and just say, have a blessed week. May